Brendan Stimpy debuted in 1991 alongside Doug and the Rugrats as one of the original three Nicktoons. It was an instant hit, and since has grown into a cult classic, noted for its unique animation style, crude humor, and adult themes. There's no denying the effect that the show and its creators have had on cartoons since, pushing the boundaries of what was once considered normal in the industry, and paving the way for some of the shows that we have come to know and love today. John Chris Falusi was a pioneer for his time, but despite his accolades in the field of animation, he was notoriously hard to work with and created a hostile working environment for his team. If that wasn't bad enough, it was no secret in the animation industry that Chris Falusi, or John Kay, was a sexual predator who used his power and position to abuse young female artists with the dream of breaking into animation for themselves. This is John Kay, animation's open secret. This story really begins when John Chris Falusi was expelled from Sheridan College in Canada at the end of 1978 for poor attendance. Shortly after, he uprooted and moved to Los Angeles where he intended to become an animator. Chris Falusi got his start in animation for shows like Super Friends and the Tom and Jerry Comedy Show. From 1979 until the mid-1980s, he worked for Filmation, Hanna-Barbera, and Deke on various shows that he described as the worst animation of all time. John Kay has always been reported to have a massive ego, and it showed in the way he conducted himself in his work and used his self-taught opinion to openly attack other animators, like when he attacked the style and content of the show Animaniacs despite admitting to never having watched it, or when he called the animation style of the show Ben 10 gay. Chris Falusi quickly garnered himself a reputation of being a notorious pain in the ass to work with, and it's for this reason that he found himself fired from his own show in the second season. There were content issues with John Kay pushing the boundaries of what was acceptable for children's TV show. But in the end, it came down to an issue with production. Even after scaling back their order from 26 episodes of the Ren and Stippy show to 13, Spumco was still unable to deliver. According to Nickelodeon, there was a huge audience for the show. They needed to have episodes to air, and Chris Falusi was just unable to produce them. One of them's a hot chick with big cans <laughs> and nice legs. Who drew that? You? She's underage, too. Yeah, very oh. nice. Oh, yeah. <laughs> It's almost as if Chris Falusi's artwork tells the whole story itself. In 1991, John Chris Falusi would receive a letter from the then 13-year-old Robin Bird. He was her idol, she wanted to become an animator herself, and John promised her just that. He began sending her toys and art supplies. He gave her drawing tips and praised her work. Eventually, he would set her up with her first AOL account and even flew to Arizona to visit her at her home. When Robin was 16, she visited him in Los Angeles to discuss her new career, and it was during this trip that John Kay began molesting her. In the summer of 1997, Robin would move to LA to work for John Kay as an intern and live with him as his girlfriend. She flew back and forth between LA and Tucson to finish school, and it was when she finally graduated at 17 that she would move in with him permanently. She told herself that he was helping her to launch her career. But in the end, Robin Bird fled animation to escape John altogether. Despite the age of consent being 18, it didn't seem like John was in any way concerned with hiding his relationship with Bird. It was considered an open secret within animation. So open, in fact, that a girl he had been dating since she was 15 years old was referenced in a book about the history of Ren and Stimpy. 
Robin finally left Chris Felucci after being forced into having an abortion when she was 18. That didn't stop him, however. He only turned his attention back to an old internet friend. Katie Rice was also a child when she began speaking to Chris Felucci about her animation dreams as well. He had introduced the two girls in the 90s, promising to hire them both at Spumco one day. Although he and Rice never had a sexual relationship, Katie claims he began hitting on her when she was a minor, behavior that ranged from writing flirty letters to attempting to convince her to have phone sex with him. Katie being young and naive never did. They continued talking even after Katie moved away in 1996, and he was even present at her 15th birthday party. Hi. Hey, this is Katie Rice. She is one of the young artists I was telling you about who sought me out because she grew up watching Ren and Stimpy, right? Mm hmm So, um, uh, Ren and Stimpy has a lot of uh, specialists on it. Like we have people who draw manly, we have people who draw uh, sensitive, we have people who draw sexy girls. Katie is the princess of sexy girl artists. Now I gotta tell you a little history because um, all through the 80s, when I was working at Hanna-Barbera and Filmation and all these uh, studios, I always wanted to draw sexy girls into the cartoons. But since the networks were all run by, um, by dykes, they wouldn't let you because they thought it was offensive to women to draw girls cute like Katie here. Katie showed me one time, she drew, uh, I was at her 15th birthday party. Uh, we'll tell you that backstory a little bit later. But in 1997, when Robin moved in with him, he abruptly stopped speaking to Katie a fact she recalls as devastating. After Robin left Spunko and John for good, he turned his attention back to Katie Rice, hiring her on to take Robin's place and eventually continuing his pursuit of her romantically. He would contact her via her work email, begging her to be in a relationship with him and expressing jealousy at a boy that she had liked when she was 15 years old. According to Rice, things became worse when she was working with him at his home office on a video commissioned by Weird Al Yankovic. According to Rice, John would do all sorts of bizarre stuff, like waiting for her naked in his living room, walking around exposed to her, and had even made a comment that he was going to rape her one day. Through his attorney, Chris Felusi claims that the rape comment was just a joke. Shortly after this incident, Rice claims to have found child pornography on Chris Felucci's personal computer, a claim also made by an ex-girlfriend of John Kay's in 2007. Rice had attempted on three occasions to report what she had seen, the last time being in 2017. Bird attempted to help by speaking of her experience as well, but were told by the LA Police Department that they would not be able to get a warrant to investigate any further. It was after being turned away by the police that the girls chose to come forward in hopes of warning any other young girls who would think to work with him. From the outside, it seems to me that a lot of people have a lot of information about John Kay that they chose to do nothing with, a fact that I cannot begin to understand. When confronted with these allegations, John Chris Felusi released a statement through his lawyer which not only didn't deny any of the accusations against him, but admitted to his actions. He goes on to blame them on a combination of bipolar disorder and ADHD and even seeks praise for his ability to obtain a diagnosis. If that wasn't bad enough, John would release an 11-page non-apology which, quite frankly, reads like an old man trying to convince a young girl to forget about the abuse and instead focus on the good times. He even includes illustrations in his letter and again attempts to blame his actions on anything and everything but himself. The whole thing is tragic, and I hate that in so many instances, we're being forced to separate the art from the artist, if we even can at all. I'm reminded of the allegations against Kevin Spacey, an actor that I personally loved, until he admitted to assaulting young men and used his apology as a platform to come out as homosexual. American Beauty is one of my favorite movies, but I can no longer see it in the same light, knowing what I know about what was once a favorite actor. Unfortunately, as much as I love Ron and Stimpy, and I grew up adoring these characters, the same holds true here. The statute of limitations is up, and that means despite all of the hurt, the evidence, and the suffering that Chris Felusi has caused, Robin Bird and Katie Rice will never get justice for what was done to them. 
Since then, however, Robin is reported to have a loving family, and Katie still has a career that she adores. John Kay, however, is left to mourn what shreds of his career remain. His picture has been removed from the halls of Nickelodeon Studios. All he has left is a small handful of fans and a blog that serves as little more than a means to stroke his own ego. So while it may not be justice in the eyes of the law, at least in this case, if you ask me, I'd say these girls have won. And all that's left of the legend himself is the cartoons that we once loved and the black stain of his actions on the industry that's better off without him. <laughs>